of all the macroeconomic growth models, the exogenous growth model, also known as the Solo growth model, named after Robert Solo, uh, the Nobel laureate, is really kind of the main gold standard in growth. And there's a lot of disagreements about this model, mostly because there's a, a number of big simplifications that make it not the best description of what's actually going on in the real world. However, we use it because it does help in understanding a few things that we do see. So first I'll just start off and kind of remind us that when we're talking about economic output, when we're talking about GDP, we denote that with Y and we typically say that Y is equal to consumption plus investment plus government expenditures plus net exports, exports minus imports. And in this model, we make a number of simplifications, but the main simplification is that we get rid or we suspend government expenditures and we suspend net exports. In essence, we say it's a closed economy where there's no outside influence from other countries and that the government isn't interacting or adding to output. And we do that because in essence, what it's then saying is that the the economy would be, we, we've simplified it to the extent that the output would be dependent on the individual consumption and investment within the economy. And so really what we're looking at then is what we would be interested in is the per worker output and per worker capital here. And how do we get to that? Well, we think that the that there's a production function here and that y is equal to some sort of technology variable a, right, times a function of capital and labor and any number of other things. It could also be human capital, it could be natural resources. In the most simplistic case, it's a function of capital and labor. And if we divide everything by labor, if we say, well, what if we look at this on a per labor or work on a per worker basis, we would end up, and I'm just going to divide all of this by L. If we divide each by L by L here, what we end up with is that Y, small y here, output per worker, is equal to some sort of technology variable, some sort of productivity change, some sort of technology that would change productivity, right? Times the function, times a function on capital per worker, also known as small k here. This small letter k, capital per worker, which I have here on the x-axis, that relationship we typically denote with this type of curve, with this type of production function that looks like this. And you often see it denoted like this, f of k right here. But really, what are we looking at? What are we saying that that is? Well, that is the level of output at any given level of, I'm sorry, that's the that's the level of output per worker. GDP per person is one way to kind of think about it in the, in the crudest sense. Uh, for every amount of capital per worker that we have, if you invest in capital that is supposed to make individuals more productive, then, then we would be able to produce this much at any given level of capital per worker. There's two things that we see as a result of this. The first one I just want to highlight over here, which is if we were to move from this level of capital per worker to this level of capital per worker. So this level to this level here, what we see is that we get a very large increase in output per worker. This, I'm just gonna kind of mark this as a number one here. This increase in capital per worker at low levels, I'll say at low levels of capital per worker, an extra unit, right, one extra unit of capital, one extra unit of capital per worker results in large increases in output results in a large increase in a large increase in output per worker. It tends to tell us that there's some sort of catch-up effect, right? And this is where the catch-up effect, catch-up effect often comes in. And if you remember before, we've been talking about, I'm just going to scroll up here real quickly. We had annualized growth rates of a select number of countries. And we know that the United States was much larger on a per person, output per worker, out per, output per, per individual uh, basis. And we saw countries like Japan, even France, definitely Singapore, South Korea, China, Brazil, right? Countries that were growing faster than the United States. One of the things about the production fun function that would be indicating that is we would be sitting there and we'd be saying, well, it's really this part. They are at lower levels of output per worker. And so if you increase the capital per worker, if you increase your investment here, then that is going to result in large increases in output per worker. 
there's kind of a second thing that we see which is over here kind of if we go from this point to this point on uh, on capital per worker so if we increase our capital per worker it, what we see is that we get a much smaller level of output per worker increase. There's still an increase, but it's much less than previously would have been the case. I'm going to mark this as number two right here. And in number two, what we're really saying is that at high levels, at high levels of capital per worker, and what do we mean by capital per worker, right? This is the computers and the factories. This is the, the uh, conveyor belts that are used to produce those goods that help make you productive as a worker, that help you create output as a worker. At high levels of capital per worker, one extra unit of capital per worker results in kind of low levels of increases in Y, of, of output per worker increases. And the thing that we see here is that there's limits on long run growth in output. There's limits on long run growth in output. It's another way of saying that we see diminishing returns, diminishing returns. And this comes up in economics turns this comes up in economics all the time, that we add more capital, and you can imagine if you add more computers, so let's say you've got a given number of workers, and you increase the number of computers, maybe you give everyone a second screen, and they're doing data analysis, that should make everyone more productive, they should be able to do more output per worker as a result of that increased capital. But there's a limit, because then you could get them more computer screens, you could get them three computer screens, or four computer screens, or five, and there's only so much that you can look at at any given time, we would have diminishing returns turns on that increase in capital in that very simplified example there. And so all of this tends to result in that the only way to sustain growth, right, kind of the third point here is the only way to sustain growth that the only way to sustain growth is through productivity growth. It's through productivity growth. And what does productivity growth look like in this model? Well, productivity growth would be something where we come up with a technology that makes the capital that you have more productive. The capital that you have increases the output per worker. And we would see some sort of shift here, and we would have a curve that maybe looks like this instead. We would still have the diminishing returns. We would still have the catch-up effect over here. It would just be this, I'm going to put function of capital, and I'll put two here, to indicate that this would be a case where we have some sort of technology change that makes the capital, your factory, your business solutions, your computer more efficient. You get more output per worker out of that. So one way to think of this would be like, if you were to go with a faster internet connection, for example, you still have all the capital, you still have all the computers and the business, uh, maybe you're selling goods online, but now that internet connection that you have for all of your workers is faster. They are able to do more work, or just the creation of the internet in general would increase, right? Theoretically, it should increase the output per worker. And that's really what this is. The secondary uh, production function is showing what would happen we think through increased technology that would increase productivity growth it would make you at a given level of capital per worker it would make you more productive it would increase right it would increase your output per worker at the basic level that's what the exogenous growth model is getting at there's a few things that kind of describe how it gets to that and I'm just going to briefly run through those real quick this is the main thing that you need to know or to understand here one of the ways that we use to describe this is we say well let's say that we have capital per worker and then instead of instead of it having these diminishing returns what if you had a level of capital per worker where for every increase in capital per worker you got a one for one increase in output per worker you would have a line that looks like this, which is basically a 45 degree line. This 45 degree line is also known as basically what is needed to keep K constant, right? This would, is needed, this would be needed investment, needed investment to keep capital per worker constant. 
and it is also denoted in uh, kind of general economic theory as the growth rate on population with the depreci plus the depreciation rate as a f times our capital, right? As a capital, as a as a function of our capital here as well. So then, when we understand this, we get to a kind of secondary place, which is we have one other thing that we know over here. And what I would do is if I rearrange this, and I'm going to change the color here uh, to do that as well. If I and let me kind of take this, and I'm going to rearrange this down here. We've got y is equal to consumption, output is equal to consumption plus investment here. Well, if we rearrange this, what do I get? I get investment is equal to output minus consumption. We also know that investment, right, so output minus consumption here. We also have another thing in economics that we have, that we hold um, relatively constant, is that we think that investment in the short run is equal to savings. And why is that? Well, if you think about what savings is, right, so the difference between savings, savings would be how much is produced, right, minus how much is consumed. It's another way of saying if you have savings, all of that savings must be invested. And here's what I mean by that. So let's say you've got savings, let's say you've got $1,000 and you put it into a bank account, you've put it into your savings account. You save that money, the bank then turns around and it can, it can loan out those funds for productive uses in society to businesses, to individuals who are going to buy a house or going to buy a business or going to renovate a business or something of that nature. That money is then, right, it can, you can then draw back on that money and you get an interest rate on that. You get, your, you get your money plus your interest back. And we have investment in the economy. In general, we think that investment is equal to savings and we tend to think that these two are relatively equal in the simplified, in the most simplified case here. So then we would have some sort of savings rate, right? There's a savings rate, savings rate here as part of the economy. And we can think of that savings rate as looking something like this. It would be the function, right? It would be the savings rate times our function of output per capital, output per worker, given levels of capital per worker, given levels of investment per worker. It would be our savings rate there, right? Kind of the difference here in Y in output minus consumption. And so if this is output, if we kind of come back here to the simplified way, if this is output per, cons per worker, and this is savings per, uh, or kind of the savings rate, then the difference here, the difference here between this point and this point here would be consumption per worker. This would be consumption per worker. And so if we kind of think about these on the per worker basis, we get to this steady state here. And the steady state there exists, and we would denote this kind of as capital, capital with a star here. This kind of capital where it maximizes the consumption per worker. And if you just think about it, why would that be the case? Well, if we're at this level, right? Let's say that we're at this level of capital per worker. At that level of capital per worker, we would be producing this amount, right? And we would be saving this amount. And our savings rate would be much higher than the rate right here, which is the rate needed to keep K constant. In fact, it's a savings rate that would increase investment, right? And we would it would move us towards a higher rate of capital. It would move us this direction very like or kind of the same way if we think about a, a capital per worker that is this high that is much higher at this level we would be right up here on output per worker and at that output per worker we would be at this level right we would have this amount that is needed to keep k constant at that level of capital per worker however we would only be saving this amount and we need this savings because savings equals investment right so in fact we would not have enough investment to equal the amount that's needed to keep that level of capital per worker constant and this would push us this direction and so these forces are what are pushing us towards this point here where uh, kind of the replacement rate on capital intersects with the savings rate as well as a function of our capital per worker or output per worker given levels of capital per worker. So we just go through this here so you can see a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes. Again, the main thing that we need to know and understand are the outputs of this, but all of this would lead us to a function now where the only thing, if everything's gonna be driving us to this point, is that the only thing that can really give us long-term growth is if we increase our production function given levels of technology.